Tom Hartman University Book Club. Today we're reading from Rebooting the American Dream, 11 Ways to Rebuild Our Country, Chapter 4, An Informed and Educated Electorate. It opens with a quote from Thomas Jefferson. If a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. Whenever the people are well informed, they can be trusted with their own government. That, whenever things get so far wrong as to attract their notice, they may be relied upon to set them right. Talk Media News Service, based here in Washington, D.C., is owned and run by my dear friend Ellen Ratner. Ellen is an experienced and accomplished journalist, and a large number of interns and young journalism school graduates get their feet wet in reporting by working with and for her. In March of 2010, I was in Washington for a meeting with a group of senators, and I needed a studio from which to do my radio and TV show. Ellen was gracious enough to offer me hers. I arrived as three of her interns were producing a panel discussion type of TV show for web distribution at, at talkmedianews.com in which they were discussing their viewing audience, uh, for their viewing audience, their recent experiences on Capitol Hill. One intern panelist related that a White House correspondent for one of the big three networks had told her that the, that the network registered a huge amount of interest in a hot story that week of a congressman's sexual indiscretions. Far less popular were stories about the debates on health care, the conflicts in the Middle East, and even the Americans who had recently died in Iraq or Afghanistan. Quote, so that's the story they have to run with on the news, end quote, the intern, the intern said, relating the substance of the network correspondent's thoughts, because that's what the American people want to see. If the network doesn't give people what they want to see, viewers will tune away. The network won't get any ratings or revenues or viewers. The other two interns commiserated with the first about what a shame it was that Americans wanted the titillating stories instead of the substantive ones, but they accepted without question that the network was therefore obligated to give people what they want. When they finished their panel discussion, I asked these college students if they knew that there was a time in America when radio and television stations and network broadcasts, networks broadcast the actual news instead of infotainment because the law required them to. None of them had any idea what I was talking about. They were mystified. Why would a station or network broadcast programs that were not popular or not what people wanted? But the reality is that from the 1920s, when radio really started to go big in the United States, until Reagan rolled it back in 1987, federal communications law required a certain amount of public service programming from radio and television stations as a condition of retaining their broadcast licenses. The agreement was basic and simple. In exchange for the media owners being granted a, an exclusive license from the Federal Communications Commission to use the airwaves owned by the public, they had to serve the public interest first. And only then could they go about the business of making money with the rest of their programming throughout the day. If they didn't do so, if they didn't serve the public interest, when it came time to renew their license, public groups and individuals could show up at a public hearing on the license renewal and argue for the license being denied. One small way the stations lived up to their public service mandate was by airing public service announcements, PSAs for local nonprofit groups and community events and charitable causes. But they also had to abide by something called the Fairness Doctrine, which required them to air diverse points of view on controversial issues. Separately, during election campaigns, broadcasters had to abide by the Equal Time Rule, which required them to provide equal airtime to rival candidates during an election. But the biggest way they prov proved that they were providing a public service and meeting the requirements of the Fairness Doctrine was by broadcasting the news, real news, actual news, Local, national, and international news produced by professional old-school journalists. Because the news didn't draw huge ratings like entertainment shows, although tens of millions of Americans did watch it every night on TV and listen to it at the top of the hour on radio from coast to coast. And because real news is expensive to produce with bureaus and correspondents all over the world, news was a money loser for the big three TV networks and for most local and radio, uh, radio and TV stations. But it was such a sacred thing. That is, after all, the keystone... It was, after all, the keystone that held together the station's license to broadcast and thus to do business. It didn't matter if the news lost money. It made all the other money-making things possible. Through much of the early 1970s, I worked in the newsroom of a radio station in Lansing, Michigan. It had been started and was then run by three local guys, an engineer, a salesman, and a radio broadcaster. They split up the responsibilities like you would expect, and all were around the building most days and would hang out from time to time with the on-air crew, all except the sales guy. I was forbidden from talking with him because I worked in news. There could be no hint ever anywhere that our radio station had violated the FCC's programming in the public interest mandate by, for example, by going easy on an advertiser in a news story or promoting another advertiser in a, in a different story. News had to be news separate from profit and revenue. And if it wasn't, I'd be fired on the spot. 
News, in other words, was not part of the free market. It was part of our nation's intellectual commons and thus the price of the station's license. After Reagan blew up the Fairness Doctrine in 1987, two very interesting things happened. The first was the rise of right-wing hate speech talk radio, starting with Rush Limbaugh that very year. The second, which really stepped up fast after President Clinton signed the Telecommunications Act of 1996, which further deregulated the broadcast industry, was that the money-losing news divisions of the big three TV networks were taken under the wings of their entertainment divisions and wrung dry. Foreign bureaus were closed, reporters were fired, stories that promoted the wonders of advertisers or other countries like big movie production houses owned by the same mega corporations that own the networks began to appear, and investigative journalism that cast a bright light on corporate malfeasance vanished. So the, the chapter is an informed and educated electorate. It's about our media in rebooting the American dream.